Di Morrissey is one of Australia's most successful novelists and an inductee of the Australian Book Industry's Hall of Fame. Her diverse career path includes a long association with Asia. Di Morrissey is in conversation with Pu Kong Ki, the immediate past BHP Chair of Australian Studies at Peking University and Emeritus Professor at the University of Melbourne. The Foundation for Australian Studies in China acknowledges the traditional owners of the unceded land on which this interview was conducted. Welcome, Dai, to the ESCO conversation. There are several distinctive features in your wide-ranging writing, including the recurring themes of place and geography and the landscape and local histories. Can you please tell us how these themes have us shaped your creative writing? Uh, I, th I think it's uh, uh, very much that that landscape and place is is the first trigger that that inspires each book. Uh, I don't choose the place. It's just some um, you know magical uh, events. Something always happens that leads me to the place, and then I know, oh, this is where I'm going to set the book. Mostly, it's always been different parts of Australia. I think for um, outsiders. Australia seems to be one great homogenous place, but actually, as you know, I mean, Australia is very large, uh, but equally, it's like a lot of different countries. Each state, this the from geographic, uh, you know, there's, there's it's such a diverse country. I, you know, I guess I suppose uh, equally like uh, China or the US. It's so to explore these very different little countries. Um, I generally wait till there's a reason, some instinct leads me to a particular place. Uh, and after the first um, couple of books uh, I, that became very successful because the timing was very good. I think our uh, readers were ready to read about our country and our people and our history and, and our places, whereas before, you know, if you're going to write a book and wanted to be successful, you set it in England or Ireland or, or you know, uh, uh, from a, you know, we're still feeling very colonial. Uh, but now uh, um, I discovered that everybody wanted to read a about Australia. So my timing, you know, a lot in life is just luck. Uh, and so not only Australia, but I wanted to explore the uh, the area, you know, around Australia, our neighbours. Uh, so I've said a lot of books in Asia as well, but it's the, um, it's the, the setting of place. Um, and then I go to that place and I research and talk to the people, learn about that place, um, and wind a novel around uh, all of those elements. Thank you. You have led a truly global life with a time spent overseas in places such as Britain, the United States, Singapore, Thailand, and Japan. In what ways have your rich international experiences shaped your worldview and inform your writing. Well, you can also add Myanmar, Myanmar. Um, and Malaysia <laughs> as as well. Uh, I still have a lot of exploring and a, a lot of other countries I still would like to to visit. So I would like to go to China. I would like to go to uh, some more places in the South Pacific. Uh, I think everywhere in the world there is a story and every person uh, has a story but I think it's the it is the, the the it's the landscape the history our culture it's the things that 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 make us who we are that is interesting to compare and contrast and either find differences and similarities by by going to a place and drawing on or, or the the differences, but then find that in, at the end of the day, it's the what we have in common that uh, binds us and uh, it gives the elements of a uh, uh, to wind into a, you know a good story. You have also enjoyed a very diverse career path, having worked in advertising, publishing, journalism, and films, including acting in the original. Hawaii Five O television series. <laughs> How have uh, these diverse and colorful occupations been a source of um, inspiration and ideas for your writing? Um, well, there, uh, or there was also television. I worked in uh, Breakfast uh, 
breakfast television for eight years at one point because I thought uh, I needed, I wanted to write a book, but I needed to make a living. And breakfast television, you get up very early and you finish very early, I thought. But it turned out that I was getting up at 3 a.m. and working until 9 o'clock at night. So that put my book writing to uh, to, to to one side. Uh, but I just found that um, having, uh, you know, the skills of a journalist, uh, um, being able to talk to to people um, was just very helpful in doing the research. For me to write, to be inspired, it's not to go and sit in a library. It is to be able to go and arrive in a strange place and go and talk to people and meet people and get people to tell you their stories and show you things and take you places. So that those skills... Uh, you, is, has been very, very useful for um, for my novel writing. The uh, journalistic training and experience, of course, uh, have also sharpened your sense of uh, what might be newsworthy and emerging social and political issues, which are contextualized your novels. Can you can you perhaps uh, share with us? that sharpen sense of um, what is important, what might be emerging, uh, having, having been trained as a journalist? I think once uh, once you've been a journalist, you keep your ear to the ground. You need to know. You become a news junkie. You 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 like to listen to the news, know what's going on. You read newspapers. You watch television, um, and you know. I stay away as much as I can from social media. I think that has become the the a curse of our, our time. But we talk about that later. But uh, um, by by being able to um, identify and see as you know you and I suppose it's just that you listen and you read a lot. So I mean the things that you know that concern me, you become aware. And quite often I put these in my novel, um, which are a little bit ahead of the time. So by the time my book comes out, often a year later, it is very um, uh, current. Uh, you know, which sometimes puzzles my edit, uh, my uh, uh, publisher and editor. Uh, but things like uh, you know the degradation of the the environment. Uh, uh, Population growth, um, uh, the the destruction of, of, of you know what's happening with agriculture, but particularly with um, uh, global warming and climate change. I think that is a the big issue that uh, concerns all of us from you know uh, uh, every every walk of life. And although it might sound uh, you know I can take a big political or national theme, but when you put it in a novel in the mouths of characters. Um, it's like the spoonful of sugar takes the medicine down, you know. If you preach and jump up and down, people don't listen. But if you can uh, um, uh, weave it through the characters' voices, then um, perhaps we can raise a little more awareness. We touched on your long associations with our Asian countries and their cultures, especially Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand and Japan and as you noted more recently, Myanmar. Your three highly popular novels, known as the Broom Trilogy, namely Tears of the Moon, Kimberly Sun, and The Red Coast, tell the moving stories of our historical ties between Australia's indigenous people and visitors from Indonesia, China, Japan, in South Asia in the Perling town of Broome in the Kimberley region of our Western Australia. How do you see Australia's current and future relations with its Asian neighbours, including China? Well, uh, um, I think 
from an Australian point of view, I think when I went to school, uh, history was about what had happened in England uh, and the UK, uh, uh, you know, in my great grandparents' time. Uh, and there was, I never learned uh, about um, our neighbours, uh, other, other countries in our area that are our neighbours and friends. And I didn't, we didn't learn about um, anything to do with Indigenous culture. Uh, or history, um, and so that is now be, being um, addressed. And I, you know, by in, within my novels, I'm able to to talk about uh, these things and raise raise uh, these issues because I think we've always been feeling there's there was a feeling of colonialism, which is now gone. Uh, but equally, I think. Neighbours, um, we should respect and be friends with our neighbours um, and and have, you know, a lot more um, uh, uh, cooperation and, and, and shared interests. I think when we started travelling, we would maybe stop in Asia to on the way to Europe. Uh, but now there, it is it is really heartening to see that there is a lot more interest here for for travelling in and, and exploring in uh, in um, our neighbourhood, and uh, and I think that is it's only by meeting other people and sitting down and sharing food and talking that uh, that we understand each other. You were saying that uh, at the beginning, Australia tended to be seen as a homogenous country, but in fact. It is a country that uh, embraces uh, many other countries, and it's uh, you know very encouraging to find to see your attention being shifted to our neighboring countries. Uh, the uh, the recent book on Myanmar, the Golden Land, and the earlier book, the Plantation on Malaysia. These are very exciting, I think, you know, developments in your new direction of our writing. Uh, yes, uh, and it was wonderful for uh, for me. There, there are a few years uh, ago, um, so you know, circumstances uh, do do change. But um, uh, I had um, family that li lived in uh, Malaysia. My uncle was a foreign correspondent, and and he talked about Malaysia. And uh, my uh, father had had talked uh, about Singapore, and. Um, I happen to just have a fascination with uh, um, uh, Burma, as it was, uh, and I had a dream to to go there. And then once Aung San Suu Kyi came uh, uh, came out of house arrest, then that was a few years back. I was able to go and visit, um, and I became very. Um, uh, enamored with uh, with the beautiful country, and uh, I actually started a school there. I, I started a, a little uh, a little school, which is still going um, because education uh, uh, is really the key, isn't it, to uh, uh, to progress and, and 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 learning and sharing things. So uh, there've been countries that that uh, have sort of remain very close to my heart. It's very uh, it's very sad to see what is happening at the moment in in in. Uh, uh, in in Myanmar, uh, and I hope our government can maybe provide visas to all the uh, um, people that are from Myanmar that are here in in Australia, so to to keep them safe. Uh, uh, it's a very beautiful country, and it's very sad to see what's happening. Your Order of Australia Award by the Australian government in two thousand and nineteen recognised your significant service to conservation and the environment. Can you share with us your interests and contributions to conservation, the environment and community development more broadly, both in Australia and overseas? Um, I I think it's if uh, it's it's where you live and uh, and what you observe. I think if you take just any community, any village, any little town or city, it is uh, uh, you know what happens in your backyard uh, is you know what con con concerns people more so than perhaps you know the big national uh, or international picture. I mean, people really are concerned about bread on the table and children getting to school. And uh, uh, you know, and and the da daily daily life. Uh, I had always wanted to write novels. Since I was a little girl, but you know, you don't leave school and become a novelist. 
And uh, uh, so that was why I went into journalism. And then I was working in all of these other, you know, doing these other film and television and all of these other things, waiting for the day when I would be able to sit down and write a book. But sometimes you have to um, take, you know, your dream by the hand and do it. So I quit my job in television and I went to a little town called Byron Bay, which was a very sleepy little village. It's now rather popular with movie stars living there on the coast of uh, northern, northern New South Wales. And it was there that um, uh, I got involved with uh, some wonderful people who were uh, doing research for the university in uh, um, saving whales because the whale population had been severely diminished with whaling over the years. Um, and so I was part of a, a the patron of the whale research. So that was like my first step into um, understanding that as a private individual with little skills, you could still raise awareness or talk about things. And uh, uh, and so this little town was very um, quite revolutionary. I mean, you know, we, they they wanted it to keep it very as a little beautiful surfing beach and tourist attraction. So everybody marched in the street and they stopped great big luxury resorts. They stopped that big chains of hamburger places coming in. So I suddenly realised that that as as one person with many, uh, you you can bring about and make um, make change even in the smallest smallest way um, and so it's continued to grow um, from from there if you if we don't speak up nothing will happen you have also been recognized for your contribution to meeting the needs of our refugees children with our disabilities and disadvantaged children in Myanmar and of course are improving the status of our women. These are pressing national and global issues. How do you think Australia has responded to them? And in what ways can Australians do more? Uh, well, again, it's sort of what we just were saying, that, that uh, pe people have to first of all, understand what is wrong and where the problems are and who is responsible and what we can do. I think there is always a sense that well, it, they're very big things. And so therefore, what can I do? I'm just one person, you know, what can what can I do? But it's by coming together um, that, that, you know, activism and while, you know, protests can be, uh, be a dangerous thing in the uh, done the right way, to raise awareness if you don't have a voice in other ways. There, there are ways to, to, to do these things. But equally, I think uh, we now have a problem of uh, social media, misinformation, fake news. So um, I think that has become a very dangerous and a very concerning issue because uh, to protest, you know, are we protesting against the right thing or the wrong thing? Uh, is it true or false? So um, in, the information and the correct information and to to raise uh, your voice and go to your leaders um, uh, and know that we are voting for the good people uh, and that good people are standing for the right reasons is very important. In the current uh, news reporting and, of course, uh, political, political debates, the uh, status of women and gender-related issues are very topical. I was uh, very interested to note, to read about your mother and grandmother's uh, earlier, you know, important uh, uh, interest in women's uh, uh, activities and their contribution to to uh, women's status. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, them? Uh, yeah, well, I, I suppose, um, uh, uh, you know, I grew up in, in rather chauvinistic society, but I was quite shocked when I, I was a teenager to learn that um, my grandmother, who was a very, very proper um, English housewife who, uh, you know, come out as a bride uh, to Australia and, uh, she uh, she lived in this little country town where I'm still living now. I have moved back to 
to the town where I was born, um, and that she took a great interest. I think it was more a social thing. She didn't work, of course, uh, but to go and help with the Red Cross, with, uh, you know, um, uh, good, you know, charity groups. But then she noticed that there was a population of Indigenous families that were on the outskirts of the town who were not embraced and not included. Uh, and she was very um, uh, um, uh, uh, brave and, uh, uh, in a way to, to say we must include them. And she was one of the first to then have, uh, you know, include um, uh, the um, Indigenous families and to help them and, and, and uh, you know, in, include them in the general doings of the town. And then my mother... Um, she was widowed when I was 10, very sadly, and my father and my uh, baby brother drowned in an accident. And so she went overnight from being just a housewife who had never really worked to being almost penniless and just her and me. Uh, and so, you know, she ended up um, um, with the, through the local community who included some, you know, people that actually worked in movies and film. Um, she, uh, um, they said there's this new thing coming called television. And so, which had just started in Australia. Uh, you should, uh, you should, uh, you know, get into that. So she did a course and she became a casting director and then in a continuity and she worked her way up uh, and she became in a very much man's world our first woman film director, television director. So for me, you learn by example and, and you know, my mother against the odds became, you know, a successful woman. But I did see that she was, was often, she wasn't paid as much, she wasn't treated as well. Uh, but she set a very good example to me, and I try to feel that I have set the same example to my daughter, um, uh, but it's how women are treated. It's still very much, you know, a, a man's world, um, and we need to to change um, and, and have the equality of pay and respect for uh, women doing a job as equally as well as men. Make sure to watch part two of our conversation with Di Morrissey and our full collection of conversations with some of Australia's leading authors.